I've got here is a uh, wild silk fiber samples. So we try to put these silk fibers into composites and combining with uh, polymers. These are two composite samples. One is made of a uh, silk, wild silk, and the other is made of a uh, carbon fiber. So the silk composites is uh, lighter in color and also lighter in weight. We can also make um, lighter uh, lattice structures like this. So this is made of uh, silk fibers and epoxy resin polymers. It's lighter than water, okay? So it's very cool. Before I, I um, started to make uh, silk composites, I actually studied for quite a long while uh, the silk fibers. So I know they are special and unique. I know like people cannot make these fibers without using uh, the animals. So I thought, okay, we have been using these silk fibers for textiles for thousands of years. And now we, we have developed composites for, for the last century. So why not we combine silk fibers with uh, more versatile polymers to make biodegradable composites. So that was the beginning. Our silk composite, uh, in terms of uh, mechanical performance, is superior. It's much better than the reported uh, silk composites. So we can get a uh, tensile um, strength of 300 megapascal. So this is a, a much higher than the reported tensile strength for other silk composites. It's um, three times, at least three times better, higher. And the other point is we can, by using these continuous fibers, we can make higher fiber content in the composite. This would make uh, silk composites kind of a more uh, environmental friendly and greener because it's made of a protein. It can be degraded by the natural environment. I think we are aiming for degradable um, implants. We think one of the, uh, compared to other natural fibers like uh, uh, fibers made from cotton, they can't be absorbed by the human body. So fibers made of uh, proteins can, uh, can be absorbed uh, by the human body is kind of an advantage compared to other uh, natural fibers of, for example, from plant source. We've been looking at polymers that are both electrically and ionically conductive. And as uh, was mentioned, one of the areas where these materials are really interesting at the moment is for interfacing a whole wide variety of different electronic biomedical devices with living tissues of various sorts. So examples of these might include pacemakers that go in the heart or uh, deep brain stimulators that go into the brain for treating Parkinson's disease or cochlear implants for the ear. But there are also a number of other devices that are being considered such as peripheral nerve interfaces for restoring motion or interfacing arms and legs with bionic components, or even electrodes that would be someday implanted directly in the brain and would be used for long-term brain machine interfacing. Conjugated polymers like PDOT are important for this application because devices are hard, rigid, metallic or semiconducting crystalline inorganic compounds, whereas living tissue is a soft, squishy, wet, ionically conductive substance. And conjugated polymers are able to talk to both sides of this interface. I've always been very interested in materials that interface engineered devices with biological systems. I mean, I read science fiction like many other uh, scientists, and there's lots of examples from movies, you know, where you have Luke Skywalker or, you know, the $6 million man, where people are trying to interface electronic components 
And in the biomaterials field, frankly, there's been a lot of work to make non-electrically active biomaterials that, you know, artificial hips or artificial eyes or things that were more mechanically inclined. But I didn't see very much attention being given to electrically active materials, even though there's a lot of electrically active tissues and a lot of electrically active things that these kinds of materials would be able to do. And it's frankly only been recently that we've been able to make electrically active polymers that are so chemically stable, like these materials are, that we can even consider putting them in the body. In this particular project, we're looking at urinary tract infections. So this is a big issue in the United States, around 11 million cases, cost nearly $3 billion annually to treat. And it, about half of all females in the United States will experience at least one, to you at one UTI in their lifetime, with almost a third of those experiencing reinfection. Now, the primary pathogen that's involved in these UTIs are uropathogenic Escherichia coli, or E. coli. So when the E. coli invade the human urinary tract, they find themselves in a kind of an unusual environment in that there is not a lot of iron around. And these UPEC strains, just like humans, we, they need iron to survive. So when they're in this very iron-poor environment, they have to go scavenging for iron. And the way that the E. coli do this is they'll release molecules called siderophores. And in the slide at the top there, you see a little orange triangle, that's a siderophore. The siderophore is basically this little molecular net that when it finds iron floating around, it grabs onto it and complex with it, holds it very tightly and won't let it go. Once the siderophores have grabbed the iron, then the bacteria will pull that into what's called the tone B dependent transporter, that TBDT, right? It's that tube at the top. And that's basically what it is. It's this big beta barrel tube that can allow the siderophore and the iron to come in. And once it's there, then the critical part is transporting it through the membrane. And what does that is called the tone B complex. And that's that little three cluster of proteins there in blue in the middle. My collaborators, they wanted to look for small molecules which could target that tone B and try to shut down that transport of iron. So they screened about 150,000 compounds and were able to identify two molecules which specifically inhibit tone B. And the really exciting thing about that is by going after the iron transport, you're only killing bacteria that are in the urinary tract, right? And you're leaving other bacteria alone, right? A lot of antibiotics which are used now are broad spectrum, meaning that they are gonna kill bacteria both in your gut and in your urinary tract. And E. coli is perfectly fine to have in your gut and beneficial, right? So by going after Tone B, which is only utilized in the urinary tract in these iron poor environments, you can selectively just kill the bacteria that are in urinary tract and leave the beneficial ones alone. So there's still a lot more to be done, right? The two molecules that we've identified uh, are not potent enough yet for humans. And so my group, our goal now is to take these two molecules and see if we can increase the potency, try to figure out how to you know, make them better and eventually start advancing them through preclinical trials and hopefully in the future identify something for clinical trials. Mm -hmm.